While rummaging through one of my old toolboxes, I came across this set of keys that has some historical significance in the annals of scientific research. These are the gate keys to the Big Dalton Canyon Dam area north of Glendora, California, where we located one of the Caltech automated radon thorin monitors in a short tunnel near the dam. Back in the late 70s, there was a lot of interest in using changes in radon emanations as possible precursors of impending earthquakes. The idea stemmed from the fact that both uranium and thorium are ubiquitous in the Earth's crust. Both are radioactive and have exceptionally long half-lives. As they undergo radioactive decay, they produce long chains of radioactive daughters. One of the daughter isotopes in the uranium chain is radon-222, a gaseous element which has a half-life of 3.8 days and which decays by the emission of alpha particles. Radon-222 also produces beta and gamma rays as its short-lived daughter isotopes decay. One of the decay products of thorium is radon-220, a very short-lived gaseous element which decays by alpha emissions to polonium-216. The idea behind using radon as a possible earthquake precursor is that cracks and voids in bedrock contain these radon isotopes, and changes in the strain pattern near active fault zones might cause some radon gas to be released into the air and into groundwater. At the time, I was measuring radon in the atmosphere to study air pollution trends in Southern California. I did this research as a young faculty member in the physics department at Cal State Fullerton. At that time, I also held a visiting associate position in the Kellogg Radiation Lab at Caltech, where I was working on basic nuclear physics experiments. One day, while at our afternoon coffee break in the Kellogg Lab library, someone mentioned a recently published article that suggested that radon might be used to predict earthquakes. Southern California is earthquake country, so that caught our attention, and I said that I knew a relatively easy way to measure radon concentrations in air. Because they are emitting charged particles as they decay, the radon atoms are ionized, and because of that, they quickly attach themselves to dust particles in the air. The radioactive dust can be captured by drawing samples of air through filter paper, then measuring the radioactivity of the dust samples. At the time, I was using a high-resolution gamma ray detector to measure the radioactivity on the filter paper because I was also interested in knowing if there was any measurable amount of radiation coming from the atmospheric nuclear tests that were still taking place in that era. The high-resolution gamma ray detector was an expensive piece of laboratory equipment that was not well suited to deployment in the field. However, a simple inexpensive Geiger tube would be sufficient to detect the energetic alpha and beta particles emitted as the radon ions decayed. One of my Caltech Kellogg Lab colleagues, Professor Tom Tamprello, thought that this idea had potential for the development of a regional radon monitoring system. Tom put me in touch with Jonathan, Jonathan Melvin, who was a top-notch instrumentation person at Caltech, and we ended up developing a radon monitoring network in Southern California using fully automated, microprocessor-controlled, remotely sighted radon thoron monitors. Most of the radon thoron monitors that we built were located over boreholes drilled in hard rock, and they measured a daily sample of radon by pumping air through a tube that went down to near the bottom of the borehole. Before pumping, the monitor would measure the background radiation for 20 minutes. After pumping, the monitor measured the beta radiation from both the radon-222 daughters and the radon-220 daughters for 20 minutes. That was counting period number two in this figure. Then, after the radon-222 daughters had died out, the monitor measured the radon-220 daughters. 
Thus, both the background radiation and the thoron radiation could be subtracted, leaving a count of just the radon, radiation from the radon. Here is a diagram of the Caltech radon monitor that we deployed in the field over boreholes, over active wells, and in one hard rock tunnel. The box on the right, labeled E, contains the microcomputer that controls the operation of the monitor and records the data along with a modem to communicate with Caltech over the phone lines, and a digital to analog converter that converted the digital signals to analog signals to send over the phone lines. The motor and pump on the left was used to bubble air through the water in the borehole and to suck air through a spot on the continuous roll of filter paper that's shown in the center. Here is a photograph of one of the Caltech radon thoron monitors. These devices usually were placed in sheds located over the borehole from which we were measuring radon data. One thing that we learned shortly after our first radon monitor was deployed over the borehole that we drilled at the Kresge Seismological Lab in Pasadena was that our radon measurements were correlated with the temperature in the instrument shed. And of course, that changed with time owing to both diurnal and seasonal variations. So we developed programs to correct the radon data to a standard vault temperature of 37.5 degrees centigrade. The temperature corrected radon data shown in this figure looked pretty good, and that gave us high hopes that we would be able to predict earthquakes from our radon data. However, that was not to be because as we expanded the network to more than a dozen sites in Southern California and we accumulated more data, we found that temperature was not the only environmental factor that affected the radon signal. Atmospheric pressure changes, rainfall, water level in the boreholes all affected the radon signal. One interesting factor that markedly affected the radon signal was the emission of CO2 in the boreholes. We found that when the water level dropped in some of our boreholes, carbon dioxide began to emanate from the rock and that affected the radon measurements significantly. Using a variety of mathematical techniques to improve the signal to noise ratio in our radon data, we were able to observe at least one radon signal that appeared to be connected to a regional strain event in Southern California that produced a 6.6 .6 magnitude earthquake in the Imperial Valley. However, with the primitive computers available at the time, we were only able to determine that after the fact, not beforehand. So it quickly became clear that determining whether a radon anomaly was a true earth earthquake precursor or just the result of environmental effects could not be done fast enough to be able to make predictions. Today, there is still some interest in using radi radon measurements to predict earthquakes, and with the ability to process data much more rapidly with today's computers, it may be possible to decide whether a radon anomaly is the result of tectonic change or just environmental changes, and to do this fast enough to make predictions a reality. I hope that you have found this bit of scientific history interesting. If you have any questions, please add them to the comments section, and please take some time to watch some of my other YouTube videos.